Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this special program to launch Women, Women's History Month. I'm Michelle Miao. If this is your first time here and have heard of the program, I always like to open up and say the Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. <laughs> All right, now it's time to introduce our guests. I'm so excited, so honored, so deeply honored to have both of our speakers here with us today. In person, Christina Carl, uh, who has made history as the first out trans sports reporter, and now we can call her our very own here in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's the sports editor for the San Francisco Chronicle. And, yeah. Thank you. And we have with us via Zoom, because we can do that now, and it's normal now. And also, uh, you'll all understand, because when you're juggling a family, a baby, a career, that's what we can do. We have with us Hannah Gordon, who's the Chief Administrative Officer and General Counsel for the San Francisco 49ers. The NFL has hailed her as one of the most influential people in the league. Let's welcome Hannah to the program. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Well, why don't we start off with uh, both of you sharing, you know, that 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 moment in which you landed your dream job. You know, what role was it? What what organization or corporation or? Yeah, tell us about that moment you landed your dream job. Why don't we start with Christina? Oh well, that'll make it pretty easy. Um, golly, I'd say. Uh it's kind of hard because when you work in sports, they're kind of all dream jobs. But uh, certainly, co-founding Baseball Prospectus was easy as a you know. Then I got to be my own boss. But really, I think like the the job that was kind of the most exciting breakthrough was when ESPN hired me ten like in 2011, and that was something that uh, I had not applied for a job, but I was called out of the blue. Um, they had a writer who was leaving, and I was on the list of six people they thought in the country who could potentially replace them. And so I was like, all right, well, that's very flattering. And so had long, long, long conversation uh, that wound up with my not getting the job. But at the end of the interview, or like the series of interviews, they're like, you know what? We, we like you so much. If we had a second job, would you still be interested? And like, well, sure, you're ESPN and you called me out of the blue and you've hired most of my writers. So yeah, I would listen. And then figured it was just a nice thing to say, but a month later they called and they had a second job. So uh, that turned into a really nice 10 year run with ESPN. Uh, got to do some really remarkable work, uh, not just in baseball, which was of course my first calling, but uh, doing stuff with on the national level and then uh, working on some of the big projects involved with the Arthur Ashe Award. And so like some really, and then covering the first trans athlete to compete for the United States. Uh, it, Chris Mosier, who ran our, was a duathlete for Team USA at uh, the International Duathlon Championship in 2016. So that I take as kind of like a highlight of my career is the opportunity or the privilege of getting cover Chris's exploits. So um, yeah, and so that all turned out really well. And now I'm at the Chronicle, which, you know, how could I put it that below something else? So it's kind of, like I said, it's a never ending string of dream jobs and amazing opportunities. Thank you. Hannah. Um, well, they should really tell you that your punishment for coming on Zoom is that you'll be 40 feet tall on a video wall. <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, I wish I was there in person um, for so many reasons, including just to feel the energy of all of you who are there. But I appreciate you having me um, over Zoom because I had a pre-scheduled family vacation, the first time taking a three-month-old baby on an airplane, and we survived. Um, but we didn't have quite the right lighting and sound where I was going to do this. So here you are in a bedroom with me. But I think we've normalized this now um, over the last two years, which is actually, I think we'll probably talk about today, something that's been really powerful for women, 
um, because balancing uh, all of the demands that we have on us can require us to be in many places at once. And this has been a really uh, life-changing experience in the last two years, obviously. Um, but you asked me about dream jobs. And like Christina, I think I've had many dream jobs. I think your dreams just continue to evolve over time. So when I got the football beat at the UCLA Daily Bruin, um, as a college student, that was my dream job. And when I was hired to be the director of legal affairs at San Francisco 49ers at 29, that was my dream job. Uh, so I've had a lot of dreams. Uh, and even, I think some of them don't have to be a job for somebody else. When I published my book a year and a half ago, that was a dream for me. And uh, whether you call it a job or not, I think, like Christina said, it's sports, every, every job is a dream job. Thank you. Well, you know, it's a common question that people get, but especially women and especially, especially transgender women, uh, when you are successful or you're the first of something uh, or you've made history, you know, in this way. And so when you both talk about you know, these roles that you've landed in it being part of a dream, um, you get a, a common question of like, how did you how did you get there? As if the question already sets the tone, like it must have been hard. And so if you could share with us if uh, at any time in that journey, you know, you, you kind of pinch yourself and said, you know, I don't see people like me. I don't see people who think like me. I don't see people, I don't see women <laughs> or, or, you know, something along those lines. If you could share uh, those experiences. Christina? Well, okay. Um, of course, my transition was mid-career. When I came out in 2002, 2003, um, so to speak, I had seen how the other half lived. So transitioning, you know, and being worried and being in my own headspace as far as like, I'm the first trans woman to even attempt to do this. My own mother said I'm going to have to leave sports and, and like, I'm, I'm not going to leave sports until somebody makes me. I'm going to keep trying and see how it works out. I don't know that it can't do it. Um, and so went into it thinking like, you know, okay, I have no idea what my expectations are or what kind of level of acceptance I'm going to find. Um, fortunately, I found a lot of acceptance, not just among my teammates, because they all understood I'm not getting a trans, like a personality transplant. I still like sports. I still want to talk about baseball all the time. I still want to do the same things, but I just need to change this one thing about myself. And otherwise, I'm the teammate you've always known. So going in with that level of concern and being able to reassure everybody that it, I'm still me, still interested, still going to be boring on the same subjects, still going to tell the same jokes. Um, but it was interesting for me because immediately switching from being worried about being the only trans person in the room to re recognizing and it being embraced by so many of the other women in sports as far as like I remember the first time I went to an all-star uh, lunch and Bud Selig always tells the same well, always told the same jokes he had the same patter every year he even would do the same Sal Bando you know call out even if Sal wasn't in the room so it was really tedious but Nevertheless, every year at the All-Star break, the commissioner would have a luncheon for the BBWA. So I show up, and Amanda Comack, at the time with the Washington Times, comes running up to me and says, oh my God, thank God you're here. It's such a sausage fest. And I'm like, yes, I guess you're, you're right. I, I, you know, I'm worried about being the only trans person here. And it's like, no, there are two of us in this room. And, you know, like, and it is a sausage fest. This is terrible. So, you know. Um, finding and being embraced on that level, uh, just as somebody who is an ally and somebody who understands like that we're facing the same kind of uh, prejudices, uh, problems. I remember the first time going, like my first cat call in the locker room. Okay, that's both validating and also don't do that. You know, like, you know, so all of which is, you know, one of those things where it's like, all those experiences, I didn't necessarily anticipate them. I didn't anticipate the level of acceptance I would get. But uh, again, the fact that so many women were in my corner from day one, uh, one of them was right here in the audience, former president of the Baseball Writers Association of America. Uh, I remember Susan, like when uh, I first became a member of the BBWA, President Susan Slusser, or no, you weren't president at that time, but Susan Slusser, the San Francisco Chronicles beat writer for the San Francisco Giants, is right there in the first row. Yeah. And Susan, though, like 15 years ago, I mean, I'd been working alongside or against or competing with, and yet Susan, like working for my outlet, and of course Susan was working for the Chronicle, or for the Chronicle at that time, you weren't, yes, you were. But then 
it was, she was always somebody who was invested and invested in all women in terms of everybody who was on the beat, anybody who was working in baseball journalism. Um, and so she was very quick to sit there and say, are the boys being good to you? Are they not being good to you? How are they treating you? Are you? Is it going to be okay? And what can I do to help? And so, you know, just right there from the start to have that kind of level of acceptance from a colleague and a peer. Um, again, I can't stress enough how much the level in which we can help each other if we just actually kind of always stay invested in the fact that there are so few of us in this space. And if we do something good for each other, it can turn into something so much more. Thank you. Hannah. Um, well, actually, like Christina said, I think women sports writers have been um, some people who have been incredibly supportive in my career because I started in that path in college in journalism. The Association for Women in Sports Media um, was an incredible resource to me then. Um, and there are women, you know, in the Bay Area who covered sports for the last 20 years, like Janie McCauley at Associated Press, who was when I was a little Raiders intern um, many, many moons ago, uh, really took me under her wing. And so there's there's a lot of women who have supported me throughout. Certainly, I've come to places where I was the only. And I think the time that probably became most obvious to me is when I got to the NFL League office uh, in 2009, because um, I was the only woman in my 10-person department who was not a secretary. Um, and that's not to knock being an executive administrative assistant, because that is hard work um, and, and a job that should be deeply respected. Um, but I did... I was certainly more aware there. And I think we also can feel different for a lot of different reasons. Like as a Bay Area person, being in New York where everyone else who worked there pretty much was from the tri-state area was a real culture clash. Um, and that was really interesting to me to understand, you know, diversity is more than race, more than gender. More, it, there are so many different ways in which we we all differ from one another and it can be great, but when you're in an environment where it's a very homogeneous environment and you're the person who's different, it can also be difficult. Thank you so much both for sharing. And uh, I'd love to open up an opportunity to give uh, Susan a round of applause too. Thank you so much for being with us and <laughs> another Shiro in the room where we're all Shiro's. Um, yeah, it's so great. What about, you know, specifically within your role, like your job where you've noticed that gender has an impact? Uh, I know that we're you know, doing a screening later on, and I don't know if you have, have seen the uh, documentary with the U.S. women's soccer team, um, LFG, but they, there's a scene in there where they talk about, you know, that they're going through this lawsuit and the... Um, the U.S. Soccer Federation had tried to come up with an argument that, you know, they shouldn't be paid as much as men because biologically they're just, you know, more inferior. <laughs> uh, something like, I, I can't even say it because it yeah. makes me feel <laughs> disgusting. But, yeah, can, can you relate at all? Um, yeah and no. I mean, like in the sense of, uh, yeah, I run... Again, having seen how the other half lived, I had, and then my first time in the press box, for instance, uh, RFK, Nationals game, I go in and, you know, like, pull out, I pull out a Workma scorebook, which if you know scorebooks, like, it's the really complicated, like, baseball score sheet book. And so, you know, not something that you just pick up on a whim. And, you know, it's halfway filled out. And, you know, like, I clearly am somebody who keeps score. Well, I sit down, and sure enough, this fossil from the Associated Press, who will remain nameless, comes tottering over and says, well, Missy, you know, if you don't know how to fill that out, I can help you. And it's like, oh. why, thank you. Yeah, I, I clearly have just been doodling for the last, like, you know, <laughs> like 60 pages, but I obviously I, I do need your help, sir. Um, so that, you know, like, that's a question that would never have happened to me before I transitioned. And that, like, right there is just kind of like one of those weird moments. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of look at it in a weird situation in the sense that I grew up on a horse ranch. My mom taught me how to break horses. Uh, most of my rivals and peers and teammates were um, young women. And so I grew up in an environment where women are tough. Women are doing incredible things. You know, like, you got to a half ton of horse flesh that wants to kill you, well, that's not scary. We know how to take care of that. <laughs> um, so this idea that women were less than was something that literally never, like, 
was not part of my life experience growing up. And so like this, the, anything like, you know, what the women and the women's team have had to put up with, but just across the board, this concept that women are less than in any sense, like whether intellectually, physically, as athletes, as leaders, as role models, as peers, as teammates, is just inconceivable to me. But that's, you know, something that's so ingrained in certainly the background some people grow up with or, you know, how they're inculcated, like what virtues they accept. But I, it's just always strikes me as fundamentally silly. Uh, but that's because I know a lot of badass women. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah. I love that answer for one thing. And I think you have such a wonderful, unique perspective to bring, um, having had the experience of not facing this particular type of discrimination and then facing it. Um, because so many of us as cisgender women, because we are socialized this way from such an early age, we sometimes don't even recognize what's happening as something that's out of like that's out of the ordinary. Because to us, it's, it's so painfully ordinary. Mm. Um, and I think that the things I've really noticed over time in terms of how gender interacts, and I've really spent my whole career in sports, so I don't think truly that these are unique to sports, um, but I couldn't tell you for sure because <laughs> I've worked in another industry. Um, but I think the way that age interacts with our gender is has really been striking to me, um, not being as young anymore, uh, <laughs> because when I was very young, the experience were very much what Christina was describing, that sort of oh, aren't you darling, Missy, that sort of patronizing frequently, uh, minimizing you, uh, sexualizing you a lot. Um, and as I've gotten older, and not just older, but in the positions of greater power, um, how you're viewed changes dramatically. And as I think about it, I think it's actually probably more about power than age. Um, and suddenly you've switched to suddenly you're difficult. Uh, so suddenly it's like, oh, why are you so aggressive? And it's like, wait, you said I was a doormat four years ago. Like, I'm so, I'm so confused. Like, have I changed? No, of course not. It's that, you know, we perceive women in positions of less power or younger in a certain way. Uh, and we perceive women who are older or in positions of more power um, in a different negative way. Um, and it just speaks to sort of how we see gender as a culture. Um, and what you said about women being inferior, um, is so la having recently given birth is so laughable to me mm -hmm. because I'm like I, it is wonderful that you can run fast as an athlete or that you you know are very skilled but when i look at people like serena williams or some of the women on the u.s soccer team i'm like yeah they did that and then we grow human beings inside of our bodies like there are <laughs> eyeballs developing inside me right now and brain cells and then push that baby out of our vagina like, did you bring a human being into the, like, did you push a person into the world? Like, cause LeBron's great. But like, until you do that, I can't say that you're at Serena's level. I just <laughs> that was a great point that we could probably end the show now and <laughs> go have some wine. Um, <laughs> what about, uh, you know, if you can recall a moment in which you've had to rise to the occasion, just like the women's soccer team, even though it was uncomfortable to sue their own employer, they knew they had to do that to open the doors for a lot of other women, a lot of other, you know, young female athletes. So share with us maybe a, if, if you have a story like this where you said, you know what? Yeah, this feels wrong and I'm going to do something about it. Christina? I, I've got... Two. One is like, you know, kind of uh, lighter hearted because, again, it kind of reflects like boys being doofuses and women overcoming. But um, and one that's a little darker, but uh, if I can share both. But the one that's a little more lighthearted was that uh, when I was still at Baseball Prospectus, we created a contest. It was right after American Idol had become a thing. So we totally ripped it off and created Prospectus Idol where we were going to offer somebody essentially, you know, we opened the field, we were going to create a full-time job for somebody if you won the contest. And so like, you know, writing on a specific topic. And so we would have this collection of young writers all write on this subject and we judge their, publish their results or publish their stories and, you know, like see who won at the end of the whole thing, like who was the most promising young writer. And um, I was the, only person, only non-man in the, you know, like panel of people picking. And we had about 2,000 applicants and we went through and read all of the applications. And 
um, the other judges there, they picked all guys. And uh, that was kind of like, that's dumb. There are women in this pile. Why are we not talking about some of them? So the ten, among the 10 finalists, I like to take credit for the fact that we, I squeezed in one young woman who, uh, you know, everybody's like, well, I don't know if she's that good of a writer. The, the, the boys were grumbling. But we wound up, uh, you may know her today, Brittany Garoli. Uh, she did not win the contest, but she's an incredible journalist at The Athletic. And, you know, like she was the one woman in the field. She has gone so much further than all of the other contestants. Let's put it that way. Um, so it's kind of ridiculous that, like, one, we had to fight to get her in. Um, and then, you know, the fact that, again, she, although she did not win the contest, ultimately she has had such a tremendous career. Um, she doesn't know that to perspective idol, that's for sure, because she's got way too much talent. But I just love the fact that um, all it took was just like one, like one little nudge to say like, you know, we really should, you know, think about diversity and think about like the fact that there are a bunch of women who could totally belong in this field and should be in this field. So, so that's the lighter one. And certainly, like, like I said, Brittany doesn't know anything to anybody. She's amazing. But um, on a darker side, uh, thinking about one of the, when I got involved with police reform for a number of reasons uh, in Chicago, um, I found out about one uh, trans woman who had, and this was after I had spent two years fighting with the Chicago Police Department to get them to adopt a new ordinance for how they treat and uh, trans people both in any police interaction and, and also when they're incarcerated. Um, and I found out about one trans woman who had been arrested, uh, thrown into jail, was being housed with the men in the Cook County Jail, had been abused pretty much every way you can imagine in that circumstance, um, had been held there for, at that point, 18 months uh, without trial. And that just, I had to do something about it. So finding her a lawyer who would work, represent her pro bono, uh, getting her out, uh, getting, you know, just the inequities within our justice system are not uh, something that a sports writer can fix. But, uh, but I did think of that as something where it's like uh, getting, getting Isha out of jail was just something that yeah, I had to do it. And uh, I think it gets into, like I said, some of, the, some of the problems we have as a society, some of the problems we, like even when you think you've achieved a result in public policy, that you still haven't, you know, people are still screwing it up or they're trying to screw it up and they want to hurt people. And this is a situation where, again, I, it, I just couldn't let it stand. And so that's where thinking about it and thinking about helping her, you know, uh, I had to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, amen. That deserves our hand. That's beautiful, Christina. Um, I definitely wouldn't compare myself to a women's soccer team in, in any example. Um, but I think, as I think about sort of what are these ways in which we protest, we talk a lot about microaggressions, but I think it's important to also recognize micro protest. Um, and that for many of us, is certainly I think this is true, I would guess for you, Christina, our existence alone is a protest. Um, our walking into the spaces that we walk into um, and particularly being ourselves, like to the extent that we are able to authentically be ourselves, that is a protest. Um, I've had, whether it's being outspoken or whether it's simply existing in the clothes that you want to wear and the makeup that you want to wear. Um, I've had so many people talk about me because, you know, oh, she wears too much makeup or like, oh, who, how can she wear high heels to work? Like just being ourselves, choosing the way in which we express womanhood, that can be different for everyone. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, somebody will say about somebody else, oh, you know, why doesn't she dress more feminine? It's, we can't win, right? And so it, choosing to express our femininity, our womanhood, um, actually kind of hate the word femininity because it sounds really dainty, but our womanhood, I'm going to go with, um, in whatever way feels authentic to us, I think is a protest in and of itself. Um, and then I would say, secondly, we all have our own way of doing this. And for me, one of the things that's most authentic to me is humor. And so one of the ways in which I often will point out to other people their own, um, let's say, challenges uh, <laughs> is through humor. And one example was I was in a room 
and there was actually one other female in the room and she was sitting behind me and somebody in the room started talking about oh you know a girl kept the stats for this you know so we can't we can't we couldn't rely on the stats and so rather than saying you know i find it offensive that you said that i said oh a girl gross <laughs> like you know like really emphasizing what they said and the whole room erupted into laughter and start and I, and I knew this was going one of two ways right like either i'm gonna lose this room and the room's gonna turn on me um or they're gonna lose the room and the room's gonna turn on them and and the skill with which i can make this funny is going to largely determine <laughs> those, that, that outcome and the room did turn on that person in a way that then kind of made people more aware. And I hadn't even really thought of it in any way as like a statement until I'd left the room and somebody who'd been in the room said to me, I'm so glad that you did something because the woman in the back of the room who was significantly younger and junior to me had turned red when the person made that comment um, and, you know, clearly felt uncomfortable. And so to me, it was a lesson not only to use humor, but also that there's always going to be somebody else coming up behind us. And so it is really important to speak up because there's going to be somebody who has less of a voice than I do, and I need to protect them. Thank you. You both touched on something that I think is incredibly important, which is uh, supporting other women in the workplace or any organization in general, of course. Uh, but especially right in the workplace, like when we're talking about making other opportunities for the future or breaking the ceiling, <laughs> you know, all these things that we say, um, that's in an effort to change and then open other doors. Can you talk about the importance of supporting other women in the workplace? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think of this, I mean, uh, not only am I, it's, I think a significant portion of my success a product of the acceptance that I have gotten from other women in the world of certainly baseball, baseball reporting and baseball journalism, uh, Susan first and foremost, but so many others as well. But then beyond that, uh, that effectively helped make my career plausible and possible. But beyond that, um, I think of you know always the obligation we have to each other in terms. Of, I, I my last year at ESPN, I was. Um, it was kind of interesting. They, they, I got, I asked for, and she asked for. We wanted to work together, and they kind of pushed us together because we we're the only women on the baseball beat for ESPN. Uh, so I said, like, I want to work with Marley, and Marley's like, and I want to work for Christina. I want to be her writer, and we're like, yes. And so, um, and we had an incredible year together, and we did things that, you know, essentially empowered each other. To allow her to dare to tell stories that she wasn't necessarily going to get the the word she wasn't going to get yes from the boys um we did a story like you know this was summer of 2020 and so like everybody all of the protests all of george floyd and like related stuff going on that um a lot of the guys didn't want to touch that they they did were not interested in talking about race in baseball which like and again when you had like players kneeling, players actually saying things. How are you gonna avoid this subject? Well, Marlene and I are like, we have to get into this. If the boys aren't gonna do it, we should do it. And it's okay, neither one of us, I mean, like, you're Hispanic and I'm a trans white woman, so it's crazy that we're doing this story, but we're gonna do this story because the white guys are not gonna do the story. And so, you know, like, and I'll, you know, like, we'll talk to, you know, like, again, Claire Smith uh, was an editor at ESPN. We had her in our corner. Uh, she's a Hall of Fame. Uh, African American like journalist, first woman to work on a baseball beat nationally. Uh, she was in our corner and got her to line up behind us. Um, also had Howard Bryant helping us, but uh, all of which was just sort of like, and Marley did this amazing story that nobody thought she had in her except for me. And uh, just, again, it was important for us to do it, not just in the moment, but also in terms of saying like, yes, we should be doing, we should be in the business of doing our jobs. And if you guys are just going to pretend that this isn't a story about baseball and about recognition that social justice initiatives have arisen in baseball, you know, like talking to, you know, people like, I mean, Reggie ultimately bailed on the project and that was unfortunate, but like, you know, Ken Singleton and, you know, talking to older 
African American players about like what was going on when you were black and a player in New York in the 70s, you know, in the in the era of Bro the Bronx is burning. If you were a black and in America and coming up in baseball in the late 60s, how do you look at the present in 2020 in the summer of the George Floyd protests? Do you see the echoes in history or do you see the moment? Do you think we're making progress? So having multiple generations of men former ball players or active ball players talking about this stuff, we ended up with a wonderful oral history project. And just because two women said, like, we have to tell this story, and I believe you can. Mm. I love that. I, I feel like crying, but I've, I've been feeling like crying a lot lately. Oh. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, Hannah. Um, I think that the way women help each other in the workplace, at least in sports, to me, it, it really has transformed in the last 20 years. I think that like a lot of industries, when women first started breaking in, um, there was what we sometimes call like the queen bee syndrome, which is not the fault of the women who are behaving this way. It's the fault of the patriarchy, which makes you think that there's only one seat at the table and that if you're not the one to get it, um, then you know, you're just gonna be left out. And if, if you are the one to get it, you better make sure nobody comes and takes your seat because there won't be more. Um, and I noticed even when I was an intern in my early 20s that at first I had that attitude. Like in sports, we're all naturally competitive people. Mm -hmm. And so it was very easy to fall into the like, all right, well, I got to be the one. You know, I'm going to outwork everybody and focus on like getting there for yourself. Um, and I'm so happy to see that the young women today are not like I was <laughs> at that age. Um, and that there's so much more collegiality um, and a recognition that we really only have power in numbers um, and that being the only one at the table is never going to truly be a position of power. I, I love both of your examples and your stories and your answers. So we have good news this week, uh, speaking of the U.S. women's soccer team, so they have successfully right, um, uh, agreed to a $24 million settlement. And so the soccer team are calling this a turning point for pay equity. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, yeah, a turning point for pay equity and pay equity. <laughs> ah, um, I don't know, Hannah, if you want to jump in first. I know I have my thoughts, but uh, um, partially because I ran Ed Killian's column uh, from a couple of days ago on this very subject. But uh, if you wanted to go first, I can go either way. Sure. I mean, I think pay equity is such an important issue. Um, and so much of it is about transparency. And sports is a great place that could lead um, because athlete salaries, at least, are uh, quite public. Um, and we actually were, as the 49ers, were the first team to take the Obama administration's uh, pay equity pledge. And I think it's really important going forward, not just for our industry, but for every industry, that we increase transparency in the private sector around salaries, uh, because it really is incredibly harmful to women um, and to people of color that there is so little transparency, uh, because we end up making less, um, and it's not right. I, I guess I take my cue from Anne in pointing out that this is also an important moment for, for the men's team as a result, because the women should get the money. Um, they should get fair pay, but we're forced into a situation where simultaneously you still have to strike two different collective bargaining agreements between the, uh, the men's and the women's teams. Uh, the men have been playing without a collective bargaining agreement since 2018. And so are the men going to buy it? I hope so. It's a great moment then that would cinch or, or complete what it should be, like an understanding that everybody should do what's right and achieve this. But then there's the larger problem of, you know, that the prize money that both teams get are being awarded by FIFA, not necessarily of an organization known for being like, you know, a leader, like on the cutting edge of ethics and sports. But uh, so FIFA awards like, you know, an overwhelming majority of the prize money to the men's teams uh, in their sport and uh, does not award you know, they have not embraced the concept of, sport, of equity across gender in, in soccer. And so, you know, we might reconcile it among ourselves and for the U.S. teams, and I certainly hope so. Um, but that still gets into the larger, like, global systemic issue of, you know, you know essentially misogyny in sports that FIFA does not 
rate and does not embrace uh, the women on the same level. And that's, that's something that, you know, like, yes, it's a great first step, but there's a bigger fight ahead of us. Mm. Now, could we talk about, uh, you know, both of your personal journeys when you're talking about money? I did, it's so uncomfortable um, at the same time. It's like, how do you, how do you negotiate your worth Especially if you're like the first woman in that role, if your predecessors were all male, how do you know like you're, you are asking for the right amount? Um, and then how do you talk about your worth in a way in which you're not apologetic, if that makes sense? Right, and then, and then knowing that you're going to set the precedence for other women if they were to follow in your footsteps. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Emilio will not scream at me if I uh, say like, you know, like when he offered me the job to come to the Chronicle, I said, that's great. I would love to take it. I want more. So, and, and he got me most of what I asked for. So I'm not complaining, but, uh, but yeah, you shouldn't be afraid to ask for yourself. I mean, this is one of those things where I know we hear it. We all feel uncomfortable with it. We all, there's the stigma attached to, should I be asking for the money? You're worth it. You're absolutely worth it. You should always say, I, I, think I actually, and so that's worth putting in the time to invest, like one, to do the homework to find out what, you know, somebody in this role is making uh, in general. That said, Emilio did not lowball me, so I don't want to make it sound like he's a bad guy in this situation. He is not, but um, I'm just greedy. Um, but, but overall, I think, you know, like if you don't sing your own praises in that circumstance, who is going to? I mean, like I know that it's easy for all of us to be kind of self-effacing and like, you know, like I'm being a team player, but we ultimately are in a situation where you do have to go to bat for yourself. And so that can be uncomfortable, but really yeah, you're awesome. So you should do it. You should absolutely go to bat to your, for yourself. And, and that's where arm yourself with information. Don't you know, like make sure that they understand this is a business decision for me as much as it is for you. And, you know, like, so don't make it a, a issue, a point of contention or, you know, any invest it with any drama. It's just sort of like, no, this is just, this is what I need and this is what will work and maybe we can work together. And so, you know, that way I think if you, you come in with facts and a faith in yourself, you should be able to get what you want. Amen to all of that good advice. Um, I talk, yeah, I talk to younger people about this all the time. Um, and when we were talking just about, you know, um, pay equity, and I said, you know, we make end up making less. I felt like I should caveat, like, I don't personally because I did negotiate <laughs> to be where I am and armed myself with information, which I think, to Christina's point, is actually the most powerful and important um, thing you can do. I think. Oftentimes women are socialized to see it not only as um, too assertive to negotiate your salary, but that it it's em quote unquote emotional. And I think that it's really important to enter a salary negotiation or any type of negotiation um, from a standpoint that is purely logical. And so you have to think of it as being, an ad being the advocate for yourself, like you're your own agent. And so don't take anything that they say personally. I'm not going to sit. If they say, no, you're not, this is not the market for you. I'm coming in being very clear about what the market is. It's not about me personally. It's not, what am I worth? What do I deserve? Um, it's, this is the market for the position. I am one of the top people at these positions. And so I need to make top of market or I need to make mid market or whatever you have decided to anchor at. I mean, we could have like a whole other session on negotiation. This is a topic that I love and could spend hours talking about. Um, but I do think the, the key takeaways is the research, um, understanding the market, and then being willing to have that conversation. Great. We'll see you next month for a program here at the club <laughs> called <laughs> Negotiating Your Salary with Hannah Gordon. <laughs> especially if you want to work in sports. Um, so I've got questions from the audience and look, I'm all dialed in from those of you who are online. Thank you for your questions. And then I've got question cards from our audience here. So we'll, we'll switch back and forth. We have a question here. What do you think was the most important event for women in sports in the United States? Most important. I'm gonna go with Title IX, but I'm really curious what Christina says. 
I, you know, I, I mean, that's a uh, title nine is the right answer. I, I'm just sort of like, but I'm just also kind of like, I do like to think back on when, you know, if within the Olympic movement, when you look back at 1932, 34, 36, like when, when women were integrated into the Olympics and when they finally embraced the idea that women competing was also something that should be front and center in the Olympics. Um, it did create, I mean, it, achieving that, it's also particularly weird to point out that like, you know, by the time it gets really fully achieved, it's the Munich Olympics, um, which are not, uh, we can both love and treasure because of Jesse Owens, but also, you know, Hitler. So uh, it's a little uh, of a mixed bag there, but as far as historical legacies, but yeah, I'd have to go with Title IX as well. Advice for young women approaching a career in a male-dominated field like sports. So I will <laughs> I'll plug my book only because I'm like, how do I summarize this? I did an entire eight-week guided journal just to get you through this, and I'm not sure if I can do it in a two-second answer. Um, but I would say you need to figure out exactly what you want, what your game plan is to get there, what the team around you is who's going to support you, um, and truly know yourself um, because you're not going to be able to both have the mental strength to do it um, or the competitive edge if you don't. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of building off of that, and this touches on something that I think Hannah said earlier, is that you really kind of, if you're working in sports, you kind of also have to have a sports mentality. Um, you need to have that kind of mental discipline and toughness that, you know, like you might be writing about a lot or talking about a lot in your career, but that, you know, like essentially, like you're gonna see or hear or interact with, you know, some unpleasant situations or some unpleasant people. And, you know, like some of that, you shouldn't insulate yourself from it. You shouldn't shrink from it. Um, you'd need to have an element of toughness. You need to understand that not everybody is going to like what you have to say, like what you've written about them, uh, like your perspective. You're going to have to hear it. And if you aren't ready to experience that pushback, it may not be the job for you. You have to be ready not only to compete with the other writers, uh, or other outlets uh, on a story. You have to be ready for you know, the, what the athletes have to say, what the coach has to say. Uh, when somebody blows their stack at you in the media room, you are not, you, wilting is not an option. You're gonna have to stand up and say like, no, I believe absolutely in what I had to say. And you know, if you wanna argue about it, I'm here to argue. What are the unique challenges for women working in sports versus the challenges for women athletes? I wish I was an athlete so I could answer this question <laughs> intelligently also because it would be cool. Um, I, Christina, you may have a better perspective on this as a writer. No, I don't. I mean, I, I guess I don't. I mean, and that's where I'm just sort of like, can you re can you repeat the question just because I'm just still trying to wrap my head around it? And yeah, you know, just the, maybe the uh, unique challenges for women working in sports versus the challenges for women athletes. So people are working in the industry versus the people who are actually the the uh, the actual. Athlete. I well, I'm probably not going to get a concussion. Um, you know, manning a keyboard. So you know, like I mean that. You know, I, I, I did tear a labrum once, but that's because I picked up a, my, like, bag too quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, like, the wear and tear is just very different. Um, so I, I, I'm not in a lot of physical danger as a journalist. So um, whereas an athlete, absolutely. I mean, again, I, I can joke about, like, you know, facing, you know, 1,200 pounds of horse flesh trying to kill me as a kid. That said, I don't look for situations where I get hurt or killed. So whereas athletes are risking themselves and they are pushing themselves to the limits of their like not curling but you know they're pushing themselves to their limit and competing at a level that you know is truly unprecedented and I don't care what gender you're in but just you know like um, what I think is difficult more perhaps difficult is what we project onto the athletes and so you know like some of the values or virtues that we see in women who compete um, the way in which some writers may also then project, like essentially whether it's their heteronormativity or you know their own misogyny onto you know the under oh it, she did so well for a girl or you know like 
or saying like, you know, an, an athlete like Castor Semenya, well, you know, she looks kind of mannish or that isn't my idea of like what fem female beauty looks like. Um, all of that, again, I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. The athletes do, um, unfortunately, or because essentially we as journalists haven't, I'd say, you know, advanced enough that that kind of conversation isn't seen for being ridiculous and ludicrous. Um, policing what, you know, Venus or Serena or Castor or any of those athletes, uh, how they look and projecting what might be a Western and white perspective on female beauty onto them when all they're doing, they just want to compete. They just want to be awesome athletes. They're awesome. Why can't we just respect that and talk about that? Um, again, nobody's, uh, I don't have to deal with that. I get to, you know, fly my keyboard and say what I say or interact with Susan and the rest of the Chronicle team. But, uh, you know, like we don't spend a lot of time talking about like, you don't look like a female journalist. Mm. <laughs> now would also be a great time to promote the screening that's happening later on because we'll hear from the U.S. women's soccer team and uh, the documentary LFG. By the way, it stands for, I don't even know if I could say this. Can I say it? Let's f what? go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's f and go. Um, so make sure you <laughs> stick around for the screening of the documentary. Another question. Women's pro sports has not existed as long as men's pro sports. And fortunately, we are seeing necessary investments in the women's game that will allow women's sports to reach the longevity of the men's game. However, when the question, why doesn't the women's game have this or, or that, or do that, r rarely, is the stark difference in time to, to grow discuss? I'm s so sorry. I'm not asking your question right for whoever wrote this, I'm but um, let's get to the question. How can fans of women's sports simultaneously highlight this age difference in leagues and have it be centered in conversations about growth of the game and as fans push and support leagues to reach long-term continued success? I'm super interested in what Christina thinks about this since you cover so many sports. Um, but I think that one of the ways that women's sports has really successfully repositioned in the last couple of years is as a great growth investment. Um, I think that I see a lot more excitement around women's sports now that people see it as this is a future moneymaker that I can get in on the ground floor of. Um, as opposed to men's sports where unless you already have like five billion cash in the bank, which very few of us do, um, you're never going to own an NBA team or an NFL team or a baseball team. Um, so I think that's a great way they've repositioned. I do think it, it is helpful to point out to people, hey, you know, WNBA is only, you know, 20, 25 years old and men's, you know, NBA is 75 years old. I don't know that that really resonates with people in the same way as framing it from the positive. I think that's why framing it as an investment um, has been so successful. I think the other thing to me that has really stood out that it's changed in the last decade or so is the way that we um, position female athletes. I think they're able to be, and I think a lot of this has to do with social media and the fact they have direct access to people. They're able to be so much more authentically themselves and people are responding to that. I, remember, I was a kid when Lisa Leslie and the WNBA first came out and the way that they positioned um, female athletes at that time was you had to be quote sexy and very much according to a white standard of beauty and anything else was seen as almost embarrassed. It was like the league seemed embarrassed that they had lesbian players or that they had, you know, beautiful black women who looked like black women they didn't look like white women. Why would they look like white women? That doesn't make sense. Um, and it just felt like they were trying to like lessen who people were. Whereas now I feel like these leagues are really celebrating who their athletes are. They have some of the most outspoken activist athletes in the world who are making huge changes off the field. Like, and that's really something to celebrate. And I think it's part of what's drawing people to those leagues. So I'm really excited for the future of women's sports. Uh, as am I. I think, you know, it's kind of weird because we almost like, you know, like on some level, this is a generational conceit. The WNBA has been here for 25 years. When you think back on like, you know, like how old was the NFL when like, uh, you know, Super Bowl one 
finally was agreed to between like you know the NFL and the AFL um, it wasn't 25 years old but now it's an institution and so like you know thinking about stuff that within the context of the lived experiences of my parents you know like the NFL was not always the NFL there was the AAFC and all of that before and so like the idea that the WNBA is still here after 25 years and is amazing I mean just like you know I mean, okay, I'm a Kings fan, so I don't see a lot of like amazing national, like NBA action. But uh, so the WNBA looks pretty awesome by comparison, because I mean, everything looks awesome by comparison. But but in particular, the WNBA. I mean, it's just like you know the stars. Uh, again, like when you look, think about like what's going on. I mean, the Chicago Sky were a lot of fun uh, in recent years. I. I think of it as like, you know, the growth of the stars, the promotion of the fact that it's not, it's almost kind of like outgrown uh, the brand of the WNBA and that like you ends up with, you know, women like Sue Bird are now national sports figures because the league has been, this establishment had been around for that long. Um, I feel like remiss because I have yet to read uh, Brittany Delacortez's book on the National Women's Football League. I don't know if you've read it yet, Hannah, but the, the book that came out just this spring on, you know, like, again, a, a league that was around for, I want to say, a couple of decades, I think finally folded in the late 90s, but, you know, like, again, was, like, had something going, but, you know, like ultimately, like, did not, like, thrive. And so, you know, whether that's about football um, or whether or not they didn't have the right money, I don't know, but that's where I want to learn more about it. Um, but I look at what's happened in soccer and with basketball, uh, the excitement about women's basketball, particularly also, I mean, the WNBA, I think it's almost kind of like uh, grown backwards because now like we all are pretty excited about women's college basketball. I mean, I care about what Paige Booker is going to do. I care about Caitlin Clark and what she's doing. Um, and that's just entirely different as far as like compared to where we were say 40 years ago. Now that said, even then I say that and I was like, on the other hand, I remember Nancy Lieberman Klein, and she was amazing. She was playing with the men in the U.S. Basketball League, and uh, the first league that Manute Bowl was in. For so, imagine a league with you know this woman playing point guard and Manute Bowl all in the same league right there. I'm like, that's amazing and awesome. And yet, you know, the USBL did not last long. But the idea that Nancy was both that good, recognized and accepted as being that good. Um, that she, that, you know, like essentially like, you know, achieving that kind of integration is one of those things where, you know, I, I'm always going to be excited about that because I believe that women can compete with men directly. They should be allowed to, if they have the talent, they should be on the same floor. They're better than some of the guys. Some of the guys are better than, I, again, I just figure talent should beat talent. And so like opening it up on the level of gender, I think is something that I would love to see more of in pro sports and college sports. Uh, but that's that's just kind of like again, I think back on examples like that and some some of the amazing women that we've seen in the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And this is a great question to follow up with that, and that is, when or how can we get more coverage of women's sports teams? Well, as a former employee of ESPN, I probably shouldn't tell them what they should be putting on TV, but I will. Um, <laughs> they should be putting more women. I mean, like that's where I know that. I would love to see the WNBA on TV more often. On the other hand, I would also, being in the Bay Area, I would love to have a WNBA team here. I would love to have a National Women's Soccer League team here. I can't get, I mean, not just as a question of sports equity, but I, not just because I want a bigger sports section, but also because like, I think it would just be so much more fun to be able to get into those stories. Um, so I'm eager for expansion in both leagues, but um, yeah, I, I wish that they were treated uh, with the respect they deserve, particularly when, like we were talking about the um, U.S. women's national team, they're way more interesting to watch than the men. So, like again, why they aren't automatically like first choice is just blows my mind. So. Any thoughts to add, Hannah, on, on that? I mean, I feel like that one's really Christina's wheelhouse. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't uh, add too much. Yeah, this is a this is an uh, interesting question because I don't even know how you would go about getting a team. But when will San Francisco get a pro women's soccer team? I know I know less about that because I think it seems like it's further off than the 
potential for a WNBA team. Uh, maybe that's because there are at least two prospective ownership groups for the WNBA, whereas I haven't heard of about anybody who's like looking to create a team here. We have a couple of, you know, like, I mean, the roots in Oakland, like in the men's soccer, you've got the roots and the earthquake. The roots are kind of like, you know, trying to punch both their white class and, and make some noise, particularly in social media. But, you know, and that's fun to see them get established. The earthquakes, you know, like they don't move the needle a lot with a lot of fans in the area, unfortunately. Um, so I'm sure that if the NWSL is looking at it and saying like, well, okay, enthusiasm for professional soccer on the men isn't really there. Would it be there for the women? I don't know if that's informing their decision. I would say, screw it, bring it anyways, because I would totally cover that and I would love to see it. And maybe again, in the same way that the US women national team is more interesting than the men, maybe people would be more energized and more excited about the women's team if they come here than they are about the earthquakes. Don't want to pass you up, Hannah, but No, I'm gonna I'm gonna just keep my lips sealed on this one. <laughs> uh oh. Well well But yeah. only because I think it's very possible that it happens. Hmm. But am I supposed to read it something into that? <laughs> Uh-oh. Christina, the journalist, is after me. Yeah. I, I hear there's going to be soccer at uh, Levi's, so I was just couldn't help but wonder. So. <laughs> well, we're winding down, and so sad, Hannah, you won't be with us up at the rooftop to taste some delicious wine. Thank you so much to our wine partners. I hear there are four different vineyards who are with us today. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to add the last question from our audience with my last question. And that question had to do with mental health in competitive sports uh, for women. But also my last question was really about your final thoughts or words to remember for all of us to remember, especially as young women, whether you're LGBTQIA plus cisgender heterosexual, but all of us who are eager eager to dream and make those dreams come true? Well, I guess I end up thinking about it in terms of I, being a first or talking. I've talked to a lot of, for instance, a lot of black journalists who talk about like, you know, I was the first black journalist at my newspaper or I was the first black sports writer in this market or that. And we, we talk a lot about when you're the first or you're the first person through the door, um, your obligation is not merely to yourself and to your own sense of professionalism. It's to everybody you want to see come behind you. It's to make sure that, and, and so that's a burden not everybody wants uh, or want, embraces, but I think it is an obligation for all of us that if you want to be accepted and embraced as a professional in sports, that you have an obligation not merely to yourself, but also to the future and to everyone like you. And so that's where, um, you know, that, that I think, you know, is good for, you know, like the kind of discipline that it inculcates uh, in terms of how you carry yourself or what you do with your job. I probably wouldn't have had green hair when I first came out, but I got into an age and uh, level of management where I'm like, screw it, I can, I, they're not gonna fire me, so I'm gonna have green hair. Um, and that's liberating. But, you know, like I probably didn't have that level of comfort 20 years ago. I know I didn't have that level of comfort. But that's where, again, ultimately, your responsibility is, you know, to yourself, but also, you know, to what you mean for so many people who can look at you and look at what you're achieving and hope that they might also be able to do it. I love that. Um, I guess I would say as we head into Women's History Month, but there are so many women who have come before you, cisgender women, trans women, women who identify as LGBTQ+, women who identify as heterosexual, and that, number one, you're not alone, and you are carrying on the torch of these, you know, thousands of generations of women who've come before us. Um, and also, you get to make your own mark. Um, and I think that that's exciting and beautiful. And so whatever your expression of womanhood is, and it can be totally different and unique and authentic, just like you know your thumbprint, and that's part of who you are. Um, and so embracing that, and I love what Christina said about the green hair. The other wonderful thing about being a woman is aging is liberating. And so ho however you are loving, or at the moment maybe not loving your womanness, um, you get to love it even more 
um, as time goes on. And I hope that you will, and I hope that you'll feel even more liberated to be yourself um, as you go forward. Everyone, Hannah Gordon, Christina Carl. Thank you so much to both of you for opening doors and for being uh, one of the firsts and also for being here with us at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you to all of you who've joined us online and those who have joined us in person for this amazing day to launch Women's History Month. For full programming and upcoming events, you can head to commonwealthclub.org. I'm Michelle Miao. Again, Hannah, so sorry you couldn't be with us, but next time you'll join us at the rooftop for some wine tasting. (laughs) 